Introduction microbial keratitis, one of the leading causes of ocular morbidity. Fungal infections are responsible for half of the cases in developing country. Fungal keratitis. Doctor, can you please talk, uh, uh, Doctor Anand? So, can you please talk slowly in the sense that don't rush, and don't like I said, don't bother too much about introduction because okay. most of us we know what the topic is. Okay. No. All right. Even materials and methods don't bother too much. You can go more it to the results. Yeah, yes. go slowly, Aram Singh. The, uh, this was uh, prospective international study done in uh, DMC of Dalhanga. Mm, inclusion criteria, mm, uh, uh, all patients with microbial proven fungal keratitis not responding to con conventional method after two weeks of treatment were included. Exclusion criteria includes ulcer with perforation, bilateral ulcers, mixed infection, culture analysis associated with in the fibritis. Uh, uh, before, uh, uh, examination was performed to measure size of ulcer, stromal infrared, depth of uh, ulcer, and height, hypoprone, height of hypoprone. Uh, patient uh, were given to uh, 50 milligram um, intrastromal bodyconazole uh, circumferentially around the corneal infiltrate, uh, uh, circumferentially or corneal ulcer. Uh, uh, repeat injections uh, were given after 72 hours if required. Followed up patient 1, 3, 7, and 14, 21 days every week. Mm. Uh, uh, primary outcome is measure uh, time, uh, uh, by time to healing uh, and size of the scar. Secondary outcome is measured by uh, best corrected visual equity after treatment. Those patients who developed corneal perforation and did not uh, show any sign of improvement after uh, uh, three injection of intrastomal injection, we are subjected to TPK. Uh, result of analysis were evaluated under 95% confidence interval, mean age by, um, uh, mean plus standard deviations, uh, p-value was significant, uh, less than um, zero, um, 0 0.05 considered statistically significant. Result uh, um, was 25 I of uh, 25 patients uh, were included, uh, mean age was 38, uh, plus minus 2.5 years, uh, mean follow-up bar uh, 25 uh, five, uh, plus minus 5.7 uh, days. Um, uh, most commonly isolated fungus was aspergillus, uh, 40%, fusarium was 24%, mucor was 8%. Um, 16 patients had a history of uh, a trauma or vegetative matter, and two had foreign body injury. Out of 25 patients, 21 were resolved, uh, by injection of um, uh, with uh, injection and 4% uh, not respond to tre treatment. Overall, 8% required greater than one injection and 4% uh, required uh, greater than uh, uh, three injections. Uh, visual equity uh, was um, improved from 660 to 624, 5% uh, and 13% had vision improvement for, uh, from 1 by 60 to 5 by 60. Uh, there was a minimal improvement in BCVA uh, in some cases, presence of corneal infinite and corneal area that ended in uh, central scar. This is a photograph. Uh, this is comparison. P value was significant in some cases, mean age, uh, 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 success rate, and uh, in, uh, uh, deep vascular, neovascularization and log Meyer visual equity. Uh, the success rate of intrastomal uh, antifungal agent uh, in resistant fungal keratitis by 84% correspond to multiple previous study. In our study, aspergillus uh, uh, most common species found uh, Narayana it, uh, study was uh, 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 most commonly isolated organism found. Intrastomal periconazole um, has lower minimum inventory concentration against filament, uh, filamentous fungi, better, better penetration, the systemic side effects are also less than m 40 b Size of ulcer hydro, uh, height of hypermion found to be risk factor for the treatment failure. Major limitation of a study is uh, a small sam a sample size, lack of a standard, and cost effective. Uh, uh, conclusion, uh, th this may uh, intrastomal variconazole can be safe uh, and effective therapy of treatment of resistant fungal keratitis. It helps in healing of ulcer control of infection, also reduce the need of TPK. It also helps in uh, reduction in risk of complications, hence decreased need of surgical intervention. Thank you.
So Dr. Anand, what are the, uh, what is the distribution of uh, fungal species in your uh, cohort? Um, most common uh, men uh, Aspergillus and then Fusarium. No, the percentage wise. Percentage wise, do you have any oh, idea? How many 40 Asperger? percent. Sorry? 40 percent, ma'am. In your, yes. in your study? Yes. 40 percent, you grew Aspergillus? Aspergillus. Okay. So where do you think Voriconazole would be more useful? Yes, ma'am. Uh, less side effect than amputation. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. So very important to stick to time. That is also very important. We'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. Mohammad Ragib Tausid. Over to you, Dr. Ragib. Thank you, Dr. Anand. After Dr. Raghiv, the next one is the Dr. Sonali Prashad. Dr. Sonali, are you there? Yeah, please. Good afternoon, and good afternoon. Uh, my topic is an anterior segment uh, optical coherence tomography to understand clinical diversity of macular corneal dystrophy. Regarding introduction, macular corneal dystrophy is a category one corneal stromal dystrophy as per the International Committee for Classification of the Corneal Dystrophies Classification. There is a deposition of the glycosaminoglycans in the Bowman's layer keratocytes, excess matrix, and the endothelium in the central cornea that coalesces later to progressively involve the entire corneal stroma, limbus to limbus. Although majority patients with MCD in the early stages, anterior stroma is the main site for the stromal deposits and distinctly in the central cornea, but it can have discrete peripheral deposits which are distinctly located to deeper layer of the cornea. The aim was to characterize the corneal deposits of the macular corneal dystrophy and correlate with the high resolution ASOCT. 17 eyes of the 11 patients were evaluated for corneal features on slate lamp biomicroscopy and ASOCT performed to correlate the clinical findings. The location and the level of the corneal layer involvement used as basis to characterize the deposit in the macular corneal dystrophy. All procedures performed were in accordance with ethical standard of institutional research and adhere to the tenets of the Helsinki Declaration. This is the figure of the stromal, uh, uh, macular stromal dystrophy uh, involving the center and the peripheral part. And this is the, uh, this is the OCT of that uh, case, having, uh, showing the hyperreflectivity in the center and the peripheral cornea. This was the table. Uh, where five uh, eyes, uh, uh, six eyes were uh, having the central uh, MCD and the 10 cases were having the central plus peripheral MCD. And the one was with diffuse haze with a spheroidal degeneration where the center or the peripheral could not be dis uh, distinguished. The mean age was 33.5 years with an equal number of male and females. In six patients where both eyes were included, the clinical picture was identical in the two eyes. The mean visual acuity was uh, 2160. Mean pachymetry was four, four, uh, 447 uh, plus minus 42.5 microns with IL master and 449 plus minus 42.9 microns using the OCT calipers tool. There was no significant difference in the pachymetry assessment with the two devices. The stromal deposits were restricted to the central 8 mm in six eyes. In the rest of the 10 eyes, the deposits were seen in the both central and the peripheral cornea. In one patient, no such distinction could be made due to diffuse nature of the deposits throughout the cornea, with a spreading of one to two mm of cornea internal to the limbus. The OCT imaging showed hyperreflectivity in the anterior stroma corresponding to the deposits in the anterior stroma with thinning of the epithelium overlying the stromal deposits. The peripheral deposits were notably seen as the hyperreflectivity in the deeper cornea at the posterior membrane level. In one patient aged 77 years with dense stromal haze, the posterior stroma was not very well characterized due to optical shadow effect from the dense anterior stromal deposits. 
Another patient, uh, age 63 years, had deposits in the deeper corneal layers, remarkably thick and desmate membrane, and few anterior stromal deposits on the OCT imaging. This is a picture having a bilateral uh, macular corneal dystrophy. MCD, uh, the conclusion is the MCD exhibits a clinically diverse uh, presentation as revealed on the clinical and the OCT study. MCD is an autosomal recessive dystrophy that arises because of the various mutations in the CHST6 gene. As per the clinical description of this stromal dystrophy, the deposits of macular dystrophy begin in the central corneal stroma that later spread to the periphery to reach the limbus. The description and the level of the peripheral stromal deposits are not very well characterized and have only received an incidental mention in few reports. The clinical presentation probably represents a distinct clinical presentation of macular corneal dystrophy as it is seen in many patients, even in the early ages, and therefore not necessarily a feature of progression of the dystrophy, with age from the central cornea to the peripheral cornea. Thank you. Uh, okay, what, what do you think would be the significance of this study like in uh, the larger context of 16 patients? He is asking, what is the take home, take clinic message? Uh, what do you want to say? What is the unique, uniqueness of your study? Yes, the, um, I mean, in future, we can use the ASOT to, uh, uh, to determine the actual figure of the corneal dystrophy in the cornea, wherever we have confusions. I already used to here. Yes, sir. Anything else? No, sir. Extra thing? Diagnosis of macular was clinical only, right? Yes, actually, it was clinical. We proceed to the OCT to have a better picture and uh, to see the future. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Ma'am, you want to ask him? We'll move on to the next speaker. Dr. Sonali is there? Yeah, please come. Next to Dr. Sonali, Dr. Archana Sina is there? Yeah, please move forward, ma'am. Very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my topic is microbial keratitis and antibiotic sensitivity pattern, a retro retrospective analysis in central India. As we all know, microbial keratitis is a superative inflammation of the cornea and is a major cause of corneal blindness. Almost 1.5 to 2 million cases globally are affected by uh, microbial keratitis, and the similar picture is also present in India. Because of its rapid progression, it leads to a potential blinding condition. Can be caused by bacteria, virus, fungi, or a parasite. There is a regional variation because of the influence of various risk factors and climate. Also, a seasonal variation is seen. So it is important to analyze the recent pattern of etiological agent in a geographical pattern. And this, this will help in an evidence-based decision in choosing the appropriate empirical therapy. The aim of the study was to report the infective keratitis, microbial profile, and antibiotic sensitivity pattern at a tertiary part of central India. It was a retrospective study over a period of two years, August 2020 to June 22. And uh, the study reviewed uh, institutional board review approval from the Institute Ethic Committee. We defined infective keratitis as patients having corneal ulceration with loss of corneal epithelium and underlying stromal infiltration with superation, with signs of inflammation with or without hypopion. All patients of diagnosed cases of keratitis was included. Patients coming to the OPD were included in the study. We excluded patients with sterile neurotropic or autoimmune keratitis and uh, less than one month follow-up on nil microbiological intervention. Along with that, we did a standardized form filled up documenting of the ca cases with ocular history of trauma, contact lens wear, corticosteroid use, systemic illness, corneal findings with uh, proper diagrammatic uh, dis uh, documentation, socioeconomic details, and predisposing factors. The corneal, corneal scrapings were taken by a uh, surgical blade number 15, and it was inoculated into blood agar, chocolate agar, along with gram, jimsa, and KOH. It was sent for the microbiological lab where it was incubated for 37 degree and then later on when the biological uh, culture plates had almost 10 colonies, it were uh, tested for antibiotic sensitivity testing. The other thing different that we did at our center was we used the Vitec technique which could give results of the antibiotic sensitivity pattern in 6 to 12 hours. No financial interest. The results that we came across, there was 455 patients who met the criteria and out of which 143 were male and 93 were uh, female. The distribution was uh, 232 pa 233 patients were culture positive and 221 were negative. 
out of which the pure bacterial culture was 83, that is 35% of the total, and pure fungus was seen in 146. Rest two cases we come, uh, came across was a mixed microbial growth. Along the uh, bacterial isolates, the gram negative were present in 45, uh, and gram positive was seen in 40. Along the gram negative, the pseudomonas was the most common, and that was the most common bacterial in our isolate. Uh, Staphylococcus was the most common gram positive, followed by bacillus. Uh, Streptococcus was the third gram positive bacteria. Fungus was the overall uh, most common in our uh, uh, isolates, which was 60% almost. And unidentified hyaline fungus was seen in 83 cases, aspergillus being the most common, uh, and followed by fusarium. The antimicrobial sensitivity profile was documented in uh, three uh, organisms, pseudomonas, staph, and strepto. Along this, uh, in the pseudomonas, we found that 89% uh, was sensitive to cholestin and 65 to 75 resistant was seen to most of the antibiotics. Staphylococcus had 100% sensitivity towards uh, vanco, imipenam, amikacin, and 80% towards genta. It, ha it showed 65 to 70% resistance against levoflox, erythro, and ciplox. Streptococcus was 100% sensitive to vanco, chloramphenol, septa, and 66% resistance to levo, and 33% resistance to moxie. The discussion, the clinical outcomes and microbiological patterns and epidemiological patterns may be different from country to country and it may be different in different regions of in, uh, our country itself. So uh, analysis of different patterns in particular area is important for making the decision for the empirical therapy. There are many uh, 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 papers regarding the different geographical uh, uh, documentation of the uh, uh, ulcer patients in Madurai also documented streptococcus as main organism. Another study from South also documented streptococcus and they gave, used the curbivore disk diffusion method for the antibiotic sensitivity. Then another for South India streptococcus. This is from the eastern part which showed staphylococcus as the most common. Delhi, a major study which was done uh, showed staphylococcus. Along with that, there are recent study uh, where it was a multicentric study and our institute had also participated there. Also, Staphylococcus was seen more in the north and Pseudomonas was seen in the central India. The limitation is use of the Vitek technique and also because of the loss of uh, follow-up of the patients and uh, remote areas, we had a limitation and the sample size could be more increased. The Vitek technique also is uh, more used for the generalized use and ophthalmological formulation for most of the antibiotics is not available. Conclusion, uh, although it was a central uh, India based on a central uh, only single center, but it is definitely can give a current pattern of the infective keratitis and a structured protocol can be taken for the empirical uh, and also the use of overuse of antibiotics can be uh, restricted along with that integrated ophthalmological and laboratory services can help in future uh, development of the resistance. Thank you. Yeah, good study, but I uh, wanted to ask, uh, did you you have considered, uh, you have compared with different areas, geographical areas. Have you compared with different uh, generations? Like, is, have you start, uh, referred to previous papers of the past where has there been any change in the sensitivity pattern over the years? Of course, sir. There has been a sensitivity so pattern. that has not been mentioned. No, sir. That has not been. I just uh, stuck to the main part of my study, which were giving the epidemiological pattern. And uh, so the resistant pattern had not been uh, documented in this study, but we have uh, written a paper about that. It has to be. Because mo most of your references yes. probably are from the yes. past. So yes, sir, yes, sir. So did you? So one study that I showed was from December 2022, uh, which uh, it was a multicentric study, and our uh, institute had also uh, given data in that. Okay. Yeah. But next time, stick to time, please. Yes, thank you. So we move on the next speaker. The next speaker will be Dr. Archana Sina. Over to you, Dr. Archana. Next to Dr. Archana, Dr. Prabhakar Singh is there. Dr. Prabhakar. Dr. Pooja Wagmar. Yeah, plus. So next to you. Good afternoon to all. Now I'm going to present a paper on outcome of therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty in tertiary care hospital of Jharkhand. There is no financial interest. Now come to introduction. Infective keratitis is a sight-threatening condition and the leading cause of corneal blindness in both childhood and adulthood. The disease is more common in rural setup where people are ignorant, often presents with impending perforation or perforated corneal ulcer. These cases require an emergency surgical intervention such as TPK. TPK can help in saving many eyes structurally and functionally, which may loss due to severe infective keratitis. 
The aim of my study is to evaluate the outcome of TPK in patient of infective corneal ulcer. Now come to materials and method. This was a retrospective study done in Rio Rims, Rachi. Patients with perforated corneal ulcer and non-healing infective corneal ulcer who underwent TPK and operated by a single surgeon were included. Patient who had corneal ulcer with endophthalmitis, panophthalmitis and no PL were excluded. Detailed slit lamp examination of corneal ulcer was done, including site, size, shape, depth, site of perforation, degree and extent of vascularization, hypopion and sclera involvement. Patient had started antimicrobial therapy according to the etiology. IV mannitol was administered one hour before surgery. TPK was done under PA. All patients were followed up daily for one week, every week for one month and two weeks for next six months. Now come to result. 42 eyes of 42 patients were included. Out of which 32 out of 42 patients underwent TPK for perforated corneal ulcer. Occupation of patients at the time of presentation were analyzed retrospectively. 16 were agriculturist by occupation, 12 were laborer, 31 were positive of organism of which 18 showed fungal infection and 13 had bacterial infection. The most common fungus and bacteria isolated were Aspergillus and Streptococcus. Anatomical success rate was obtained in 35 patients and graph clarity was 33.4 patients. Overall 41.7 cases had developed glaucoma and post of visual acuity was improved in 21.4 percent of cases. This is the indication of TPK showing perforated corneal ulcer in 32 cases, non-healing ulcer in 7 and pending perforation in 3 cases. This is the table showing distribution of cases depends on history of injury showing trauma with vegetative matter in 12 cases, no significant history in 13, ocular trauma by body in 10 cases. This is the post-operative complications showing epithelial defect in 15, corneal edema in 10 cases, secondary glaucoma in 17 and cataractus lens in 8 cases. These are the sequelae of TPK, showing pre of photograph, then after TPK and during the follow-up. Now come to discussion. Keratoplasty is the procedure in which diseased host cornea is excised and replaced with healthy donor cornea. The primary aim of TPK is to eliminate infectious disease process and maintain the integrity. Visual rehabilitation is the secondary outcome. There were many studies done. Sukhya and Jane reported 76 to 88 percent perforated corneal ulcer undergone TPK which is comparable to our study. Sharma et al. showed fungal corneal ulcer had higher rate of infection than bacterial. The cure rate of bacterial corneal ulcer is similar to that of our study. In our study, anatomic stability after TPK was 88%, which was similar to that of the Crystal et al. study. Sharma et al. study reported that the range of clear graph varied from 69 to 100% in bacterial ulcers and 58 to 84% in fungal corneal ulcers. Now we conclude TPK can be an important procedure to salvage eye and preserve vision in infective corneal ulcer. The incidence of post-operative complications are more in TPK, but bacterial corneal ulcer has better outcome. Early interventions, early interventions is mandatory to prevent disastrous courses of the disease. These, these are my references. Thank you. So you had almost 33 uh, percent recurrence in your cases. So uh, did you look at were these bacterial, fungal, what was the etiological agent? Uh, Ma'am, uh, in fungal corneal ulcer, aspergillus is the most common. No, ulcer. so you had recurrence of infection in 33 percent of the cases, so the infection record. I'm saying in that 33 percent, what was the split? How many were bacterial to start with and get, got recurrence? How many were fungal? Did you see that? Yeah, ma we send it for the culture and showing uh, uh, fungal corneal ulcer, uh, fungal uh, infections are more than the bacterial. So you have the data on that, did you look at that? Oh yeah, ma'am, I have data. So you have only four cases who had used a steroid out of all these cases? Uh, no, sir, in fungal corneal ulcer, we uh, didn't use steroid. No, 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 you have uh, shown that like preoperative uh, data and uh, predisposing factors. So you have shown a steroid use uh, Four patients only used the steroid? Uh, sir, uh, 10 to 15 people uh, uh, came from rural area. They are already on steroid therapy. Then they came to us. I think you have shown only four person in your data.
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Prabhakar, are you there? Dr. Prabhakar Shri, please, please. First four papers who were presented are all of you ratified members of AIOS? Dr. Anand, uh, Dr. Raghi, Sunali, all of you are ratified members. Shall I start? Yeah, please start. A very good afternoon, one and all. The title of my presentation is Internal Audit to Assess the Spectrum of Coronal Diseases with the Systemic Association. As we all know that there are a number of systemic conditions that affect cornea. Some are having very obvious systemic findings while some are not. The endocrine disorders, infectious conditions, autoimmune disorders, inflammatory disease, and genetic disorders are the various diseases which can manifest with uh, corneal manifestations. So a routine eye examination can bring attention to potentially life-threatening illnesses as well. This study was done with an objective to describe the spectrum of systemic disorder with corneal manifestations in patients presenting to the cornea clinic of a tertiary eye care facility in Eastern India. It was a retrospective study. The data was collected from the cornea clinic department of ophthalmology, Ames Patna, for the duration of 15th September 2020 to 14th September 2021. All the clinical records of patients with suspected or proven systemic diseases were collected. The blood investigations were traced, and patients who had positive blood investigations were included in the study. So a total number of cases, and this period was the COVID period. The first wave of COVID had come uh, during this period. So a total number of cases attending cornea clinic during this period was 472. That means an average, num average of 10 patients per cornea clinic. Total new cases were 243, that means five new cases per cornea clinic, and 26 patients were identified with systemic diseases uh, during our study. So these are the systemic diseases that we, we encountered and with the following uh, clinical feature that is the corneal manifestation. Primary Jogren syndrome and secondary Jogren syndrome manifested as severe dry eye, filamentary keratitis, and confluent SPKs. Patients with Steven Johnson syndrome and mycoplasma induced rash and mucositis presented with lid margin keratinization and corneal vascularization. Patient, patients with GVHD, SLE again presented with severe dry eye picture. Patients with Wegener's granulomatosis presented as necrotizing sclerokeratitis and per peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Patients with vitamin A deficiency presented as keratomalacia. So these were the various uh, systemic diseases which we could identify primarily in the cornea clinic, and uh, these are the uh, corneal manifestations which have been mentioned in the right. These are the clinical pictures of some of our patients who were for the first time seen in the cornea clinic and subsequently referred back to the uh, respective departments, patients with uh, systemic lupus erythematosus who presented for the first time with filamentary keratitis and retrospectively diagnosed to have systemic lupus erythematosus. Same year, this patient, because of proptosis, presented to us but had, uh, and had left eye corneal ulcer, but uh, actually the patient ha was having acute myeloid leukemia, and because of that, he developed exposure keratopathy and secondarily got infected to have uh, fungal keratitis. Similarly, this patient with necrotizing sclerokeratitis had Wegener's granulomatosis, and this patient had bilateral corneal ulcer, which was actually because of vitamin A deficiency. So to conclude, there are a wide range of diseases that present with features consistent with dry eye. Dry eye diseases not responding to the usual treatment should be thoroughly investigated and appropriately referred to rheumatology wherever need needed. And subtle corneal clues can suggest the systemic diagnosis. And this is helpful only is helpful in cases where we know that there are various systemic diseases that adds to the morbidity, but there are certain diseases that adds to the mortality as well, like Wegener's granulomatosis. So just the corneal clues, if you identify in time, you can save somebody's life. With this, I would like to conclude. Thank you. 
So Prabhakar, uh, good study. Did you look at the cases in a reverse way, in the sense that of the patients who presented to you, how many did you, did the hospital detect to have a systemic problem? Yeah, the list that I had shown, not all patients that were diagnosed retrospectively, like patients with SJS were referred to us. Similarly, yeah. patients with uh, GVHD was referred to us. Rest of the patients, uh, like patients with uh, cicatricial so pemphigus. So can you just quickly give the numbers? So how many in your cohort had already diagnosed, came with, to you diagnosed with disease? It's around 10 out of um, 26, 10 okay. patients were diagnosed to from the retrospectively from the coronary clinic. Did you look at uh, 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 corneal manifestations of diabetes? Um, because that's a very common yeah, systemic yeah. disease and can have that is a I mean, I would say we can say that the patients were more or less um, uh, comparable at baseline considering the fact most of the patients were diabetic. So... Something like neurotrophic keratopathy? No, no, we didn't look for that. Yeah. Yes. So we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Pooja Wagmar. Yeah, Dr. Pooja, please. Next to Dr. Pooja, Dr. Ananna Chatterjee is there. Over to you, Dr. Pooja. Good afternoon, all of you. Myself, Dr. Pooja Dilip Vagmare. I'm from VK Patil Medical College, Ahmednagar, Maharashtra. Uh, today's topic is surgical intervention aid in Muran's ulcer. Uh, my patient, 61 year old male, came to the OPD with the chief complaints of sudden onset of excruciating pain, redness, tearing, photophobia, and inability to open the left eye which was associated with diminution of vision in the same eye since five days with no history of tra trauma. Left eye vision was HMCF present, PL PR present in all quadrants. On slit lamp biomicroscopy, crescentric perf perforated ulceration at the periphery of cornea of around 6 n to 2 mm is seen at the superotemporal part and is associated with circumcorneal congestion and no scleral involvement. Overhanging edge of ulcer from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock towards central cornea is seen. Past, past ocular history, uh, pseudophagia in both eyes. There was no history of, uh, there, there is history of cataract surgery in both eyes three years back. Family history, uh, no significant uh, ocular diseases and rheumatic diseases there. Uh, past medical history, known case of hypertension since five years. Um, uh, patient was on uh, tablet tell me 40 mg systemic examination not significant uh, right eye uh, findings was normal uh, vision in left eye hmcf uh, plpr present ocular movements free and uh, full in all di direction conjunctiva mi mild congestion was there uh, cornea crescent shaped perfor perforated ulcer in peripheral perilimbal corneal thinning present at around 6 to 9 o'clock uh, fluorescent stain was absent. Anterior chamber plus three AC cells were found. Uh, iris not appreciated due to trace flare. Pupil very sluggishly reacting, no RAPD. Lens pseudophagic status, fundus was hazy. And there was a um, hypotony noted. The intraocular pressure was 3 mmHg. Uh, investigations, uh, blood work for associated systemic conditions was drawn, including complete blood count, blood urea nitrogen, creatinine, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, rheumatoid factor, anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies, anti-rho anti-la antibodies, 
uh, anti uh, and angiotensin converting enzyme anti cyclic citrullinated pepti peptide antibody chest x ray was done uh, corneal culture was done b scan for posterior scleritis was done Di my diagnosis is based on the clinical presentation and negative workup for underlying systemic disease a diagnosis of muron ulcer was made this is a clinical picture and uh, we can appreciate the uh, peripheral corneal degeneration with perforation <coughs> patient was put on topical cycloplegics and systemic antibiotic uh, the patient was posted for surgery under general anesthesia banana eye graft was applied on the perforated side graft was applied well by uh, accepted uh, well by patient and the vision wa uh, was improved to 6 by 60 This is banana graft preparation and uh, post-op day one uh, photo. Uh, conclusion: Muron ulcer is still a diagnosis of exclusion, even if it is a distinct clinical entity. To rule out other causes of peripheral ulcerative keratitis, such as such as infections, collagen vascular diseases, and degenerative processes, one should always look for associated scleritis, limbal involvement, corneal sensation, associated blepharitis, keratitis, lipid deposition, ulcerated corneal epithelium, and stroma. and so forth muron's ulcers exact pathogenesis is still unknown although there have been improvements in its care a sizable portion of patients continue to be resistant to treatments and cause considerable visual morbidity the variety of therapeutic approaches used to treat muron's ulcer highlights the relatively paucity of information about efficient therapies because each patient receives a different set of treatments it is challenging to predict the management success so that decisions may be made of the for the best management of the disease it is essential to determine the most effective modality for the treatment of the, this condition for distinct patients thank you thank you nice presentation what is the uh, pre perioperative uh, medications before uh, touching the before uh, oh. planning for the surgery yeah. Uh, analgesic and uh, uh, steroids sir oral steroids you have done uh, battery of tests for this patient what are the results of those tested sir uh, there was uh, no rheumatic uh, arthritis was noted sarcoidosis or autoimmune disorders was excluded sir so you have not shown the result of those tested which are positive and uh, which are negative sir, all are uh, negative sir all are negative only i, I have not put us and uh, we made conclusion that uh, muron sensor is there okay thank you so much thank, thank you, you we much. move on to the next talk so yeah ma'am so dr ananna you are you ready please come please over to dr ananna next to dr ananna dr shreya shoni is there dr shreya are you there please be ready yeah good afternoon everyone i squad leader ananya from uh, armed forces medical college pune will be presenting two cases of congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy their management and outcome shed is a disease of corneal endothelium that is characterized by bilateral symmetric stromal haze which is apparent at or soon after birth diffuse opacification is secondary to the abnormal endothelial cell development it may be inherited at autosomal dominant or recessive it is a diagnosis of exclusion therefore other causes of congenital opacities must be ruled out first herein we have described cases of two brothers who are product of the fourth degree consanguineous marriage case 1 9 years of age and case 2 14 years of age both of them presented to our opd 
with history of whitish discoloration of the cornea since birth and associated with blurring of vision. There was no history of pain, redness, watering, photophobia, foreign body sensation, or worsening of the symptoms in the morning hours. There was no history of large eyeballs or systemic abnormalities. Both the children were born at full term by elective caesarean section and were immunized as per the universal immunization program. Nothing significant was observed in the developmental or family history. Examination of the first case showed uh, BCVA in both right and left eye was 3 by 60, PR was accurate. Slit lamp examination shows diffuse haze in the cornea in both the eyes, rest of the anterior segment was within normal limit. Fundus could not be visualized, therefore USDB scan was done which showed retina was on. IOP in both right and left eye was 12 millimeter of mercury. Examination of the second case showed a BCVA in both right and left eye as 1 by 60, PR accurate. Cornea showed a diffuse haze in both eyes, rest of the anterior segment was unremarkable. Fundus in this case also could not be visualized, USGB scan showed retina was on. IUP in both right and left eye was 16 millimeter of mercury. Anterior segment OCT in both the cases showed increase in the central corneal thickness. History, detailed clinical evaluation and AS OCT confirmed our diagnosis as congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy in both the cases. Considering, considering the localized nature of the disease and the age of the patient, our uh, team of uh, surgeons decided to perform non-dismuth stripping endothelial keratoplasty in right eye of both the cases. Few uh, glimpses uh, from the uh, operation theater. 450, uh, uh, 350 micron partial thickness incision was made. Host cornea trifined. And it was injected with the help of bucin endoglide. Post operative uh, day one showed the lenticule was well adhered to the host with air bubble in the anterior chamber in both the cases. However, 10th post operative day showed graft was dislocated partially and the cornea appeared opaque in both the cases. AS OCT showed uh, a gap in the host and the lenticule which confirmed the diagnosis. Therefore, rebubbling was done on post-operative day 13. Th uh, three days uh, post rebubbling, uh, the cornea showed significant clearing with uh, intact air bubble in the anterior chamber in both the cases. Uh, central corneal thickness uh, showed significant decrease. Uh, 10 days post rebubbling showed uh, further decrease in the corneal edema with intact air bubble in the anterior chamber. Central corneal thickness in the first case reduced from 740 to 730 micron and in the second case from 900 to 870 micron. Six months post operatively we could achieve BCVA of 6 by 60 in the right eye of both the cases and PR was accurate. Central corneal thickness uh, was uh, further reduced to 619 and 720 micron respectively. Shed was first reported by Lawrence. Uh, until many decades, uh, conventional PK was done for all the cases of shed until when DSEC was described as an alternative. However, performing DSEC in a child with a shed poses as many challenges like uh, limited anterior chamber cle uh, clearance, poor visualization of the cornea due to clouding. A few modifications in the surgical procedure may help like using trypan blue dye for staining the desmuth membrane, chandelier endo illuminator, and performing EK without desmuth stripping. The different advantages of uh, non-desmuth stripping are no suture related complications, tectonic stability, early and better stabilization, and reduced risk of rejection. Various studies have also shown EK as a suitable alternative to conventional PK as it reduces the risk of suture related infection, astigmatism, uh, longer use of corticosteroids. Therefore, meticulous workup for a child uh, presenting with corneal clouding should be done. EK is a feasible option in pediatric patients. DSEC allowed rapid restoration of the corneal clarity and one of the commonest complications of DSEC is graft dislocation. Thank you so much. So do you not strip in every case? Is there any criteria for you to, know, to strip the decimates? Uh, sir, uh, in uh, pediatric age group, usually we avoid stripping of desmuth membrane because the desmuth membrane is very tightly adherent in such cases and inadvertently we cause injury to the lens while stripping the desmuth membrane and to the posterior stromal fibers as well. But if the child is older, if you have scarring seen on OCT, you need to strip the desmuth because otherwise the results are not that good. Right, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So we'll move on to the next speaker.
डॉक्टर श्रेया सोनी ओवर टू डॉक्टर श्रेया गुड आफ्टरनून माय टॉपिक इज चेंजेस इन बायोमैकेनिकल पैरामीटर्स ऑफ आई कॉर्नियल सेंसिटिविटी सेंट्रल कॉर्नियल थिकनेस एंड इंट्राओकुलर प्रेशर इन सेकंड एंड थर्ड ट्राइमेस्टर ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी सो मूविंग टू द एम ऑफ माय स्टडी इज टू कंपेयर द वैल्यूज ऑफ कॉर्नियल बायोमैकेनिकल पैरामीटर्स दैट इज सेंट्रल कॉर्नियल थिकनेस कॉर्नियल सेंसिटिविटी एंड आईओपी during the second and third trimester of pregnancy with their respective values in the 6 weeks post pregnancy so material methods this is a hospital based prospective observational study that included patients visiting to obstetric cl cl clinic of uh, katihar medical college at katihar bihar and uh, the study was uh, done from august 2021 to july 2022 Uh, the study was mainly affected by the third wave of covid so we had to increase the margin of error from 5% to 10% uh, then in included the uh, sample size to be uh, 60 so the inclusion and exclusion criteria is a pregnant woman uh, who agreed to participate in the study were taken in the inclusion criteria it was uh, only singleton pregnancy was taken and uh, no known ocular disorders uh, exclusion criteria was pregnant women with systemic disease like hypertension diabetes mellitus bronchial asthma thyroid disorder and uh, hematological or cardiovascular disorder were excluded uh, hist any history of refractive surgery or any ocular surgery was excluded uh, any use of topical uh, drugs until 3 uh, months last 3 months were excluded and uh, those who failed to follow up on the second visit post delivery were excluded Uh, material of uh, materials and methods uh, we did corneal sensitivity by touching a wisp of cotton to four quadrants of the cornea intraocular pressure was uh, assessed by goldman applination tonometer and uh, for uh, avoiding the circadian variation of errors 8 am to 4 pm time range was taken central corneal thickness was measured using an ultrasound uh, pachymetry uh, data analysis was done by spss version 25 and uh, the changes with uh, 95% confidence and p values uh, 0. Uh, less than equal to 0.05 were considered st statistically significant the results were that we found was a majority of the patients were unaware that pregnancy affects their eyes even those who knew knew through doctors ophthalmologists or uh, through internet so uh, cornea was least sensitive in both eyes in most pregnant women in the third trimester that is 35 out of uh, 48 females that is 72.9% uh, had uh, lower sensitivity below normal and that was compared to second trimester that is 11 out of 18 that is 61.1% had below normal below normal corneal sensitivity and most sensitive at second uh, visit that was 6 weeks postpartum uh, pregnant women in third trimester that is 39 out of 48 that is 81.25% had higher cct values uh, above normal and second trimester 11 out of uh, 18 that is 61.1% had above normal cct and uh, compared to postpartum that is 27 out of 60 36.6% had above normal so uh, pregnant women in third trimester that is 32 out of uh, 48 uh, 66.7% had iop uh, below normal and uh, seven out of 18 that is 38.9% uh, uh, women in second trimester had iop below normal and postpartum values we saw that the iop gradually uh, increased so uh, uh, the conclusion that we found was that uh, uh, corneal sensitivity and iop varied inversely with the gestational duration with lowest values recorded in the third trimester cct va uh, varied directly with the gestational duration with the highest value recorded in the third trimester so this is the mean and standard deviation uh, we also found that simple linear regression with uh, gestational age showed an inverse relationship uh, that was found between cct and iop so as cct increased we saw a decrease in iop uh, discussion uh, we could establish that late trimesters of pregnancy had an impact on uh, corneal uh, biomechanical parameters that was probably due to the hormonal changes during pregnancy which peaked in the later trimesters so uh, this was supported by previous studies done by uh, mill dot and uh, similarly reduced corneal sensitivity uh, it uh, was caused probably due to fluid retention which again increases the fluid retention is increasing the cct this was also done in the previous uh, studies by pilas pomil uh, pomikalska et al 
so uh, conclusion was that in india there is a dearth of knowledge about ocular changes in pregnant women uh, due to which if there is a low corneal sensitivity uh, then uh, they do not know that there is some uh, uh, there if even if there's some foreign body in their eye there is no symptoms uh, so also uh, that uh, reduction in iop should be considered for an alteration in management if there is a glaucoma patients even though we didn't take any glaucoma patients in this study but according to the study if we do a larger study we can establish that the uh, glaucoma management can be altered thank you thank you we thank you we'll go on to the next dr shivani is here dr shivani verma please move forward please uh, while dr shivani is starting through a very good study and you must publish it unfortunately you're not up for dr suman saurabh are you there dr suman you are dr suman please over to dr shivani verma please start please start a very good afternoon everyone uh, my topic for today's presentation is uh, variations in the central corneal thickness during the menstrual cycle in indian women uh, there is no financial disclosure associated purpose of my study was to determine the changes in central corneal thickness during the menstrual cycle in indian women starting with the introduction corneal thickness is of prime importance in pre operative workup for refractive surgery receptors for gonadal hormones like lh and fsh are also present on ocular structures and have their effect on the ocular milieu as well uh, it was a prospective observational study conducted at new iron was uh, around 541.68 plus minus 4.15 in the middle of the menstrual cycle around the ovulatory phase it came out to be 559 uh, point uh, plus minus 4.50 and at the end of the cycle it was uh, around 544.44 uh, plus minus 8.06 data for 19 women was not available for our three phases of the cycle therefore effectively there were 100 uh, 105 participants out of which 97 women uh, cct changes were seen the mean cct of both eyes was 541.76 plus minus 4.21 micrometer during the uh, beginning it came out to be 559.21 plus minus 4.50 during the ovulation phase and 544.52 plus eight, uh, minus 8.06 at the end of the cycle uh, the dis uh, the synchronized hormonal changes that orchestrate the menstrual cycle in healthy reproductive age female also causes changes in the ocular milieu by affecting the corneal thickness by altering corneal hydration and tear film biomechanics there were certain limitations associated the stages of the menstrual cycle and follicular menstruation were not confirmed by the abdominal ultrasound and we relied on the history and urine lh levels study population was not very large uh, the take home message can be since the corneal thickness and topography are of prime importance 
while considering refractive surgeries, glaucoma workup and contact lens fitting and compliance. There lies an unsaid urge to include menstrual history of females in the reproductive age group during the workup when they are to be dealt with the same. So finally, we conclude that the CCT was found to be maximum during the ovulatory phase, followed by end of the cycle, while CCT was found to be least during the beginning of the cycle. Thank you. Is there a difference between the PCOD and the normal uh, cycle? In your study, have you observed? If the patient known case of PCOD, yes. uh, and the patient, suppose you are uh, just doing the normal cycle device. So is there any difference in your study? Sir, we only Especially topo and tomo. So we only included uh, normal, uh, normal females in our study. So how did you determine the end of the cycle and beginning of the cycle? So we basically relied on the urinary LH levels. Uh, Thank you. So we'll move on to the last speaker. Yeah, the last speaker, Dr. Suman Saurav. Over to you, Dr. Suman. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my uh, topic is to report clinical characteristics and antibiotic sensitivity pattern of pseudomonas keratitis. Uh, there is no financial interest uh, uh, in this presentation. The introduction, bacterial keratitis is the second largest cause of legal blindness after cataract. It incurs significant annual cost to healthcare providers. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a opportunistic gram-negative bacteria. It causes fulminant keratitis with rapid tissue destruction and collagenolysis. Corneal perforation and endophthalmitis by pseudomonas causes blinding IDG. Rapid diagnosis and culture sanitary stands crucial in the treatment of pseudomonas keratitis. To widespread use of antibiotic caused emergence of multidrug resistant pseudomonas species, the outcomes of which is even poorer with be best efforts. We therefore decided to examine our data on pseudomonas keratitis to determine clinical characteristics and antibiotic sensitivity pattern. Method. A study design is a retrospective observational case series approved by Institutional Ethics Committee added to the declaration of the Helsinki. 157 patients with the culture proven diagnosis of pseudomonas keratitis who visited Cornea Services, CL Gupta Institute, Moradabad uh, from January 2018 to December 2021 uh, were studied polymicrobial inf infection with the, in which pseudomonas was one of the isolate were also included. Culture uh, considered positive if uh, discrete colonies of the organism on solid media uh, were found or uh, confluent growth observed along the site of the inoculation on culture plate at or over liquid media. Antibiotic sensitivity testing was performed using the Kirbyware diffu diffusion method for the antibiotics like amikacin, ciprofloxacin, cholestine, amipinam, tovra, ceftazidine, moxi and gatifloxacin, clomphenicol, piperacillin, plus tazobactam and ciproxime with a separate zone. Empirical antibiotic treatment was initiated before the identification of cardiac colony. Once the specific microorganism is isolated, treatment was adjusted based on the results of the culture. Treatment outcomes such as final visual equity need for surgical intervention and surgical, sorry, clinical outcome were reviewed. Uh, this is the result. Uh, uh, age, most of the patient uh, were uh, more than uh, 46 years of age and uh, 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 um, uh, male patient were more than the female patient. Geographical area, 91% uh, percent of the patient were from the rural area and uh, uh, in 41% uh, of the cases there was a uh, injury or trauma to the eye. And uh, uh, a in uh, injury, uh, non-vegetative injury was 40, uh, in 47% uh, patient. Seasonal variation, uh, most of the patient were from the monsoon and the symptoms uh, were blurring of vision in 102 patient, ocular pain, redness, and watering in the rest of the patient. Duration between onset of symptom and presentation uh, were 69 patient uh, reported within seven days of the uh, uh, presentation, oh, sorry, uh, se within seven days of the initiation of the symptom. And uh, treatment uh, before presentation, um, uh, Forty percent uh, were on uh, uh, missed uh, treatment and anti antibiotic plus antifungal in, in uh, this study. In uh, uh, 40, 49 percent ha had hypopion uh, at presentation, and uh, size of hypopion was uh, in uh, 40 percent one mm to two mm. Gram staining: 59 uh, percent were uh, positive in the gram staining. And uh, surgery uh, uh, need for surgery uh, was in 114 percent, 
and uh, uh, the surgery was in 112 uh, patient and this is a uh, vis visual outcome uh, most of the patient uh, who presented late uh, uh, vision uh, was, was less than 2200 uh, final visual outcome uh, was also poorer and this is a sensitivity pattern cholestine was more sensitive 98 almost 98 percent uh, cases followed by imipenem and and uh, which is followed by the uh, topramycin. This is the clinical pictures. Conclusion, ocular trauma is the major risk factor in our study. Uh, contact lens as mentioned in Western li literature was not found in our study. Uh, sensitivity of cholestine uh, was more than 95 percent. Imipenem has more than 50 percent sensitivity and uh, topramycin had uh, more than 40 percent sensitivity. Surgical intervention rate and re-intervention rate is higher in cases of pseudomonas created patient. Final visual outcome wa uh, was poorer. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for nice presentation. Uh, just quick mo uh, move on one question. Why you one patient book uh, that combined therapy with antifungal with the pseudomonas? Sir, that was uh, the treatment uh, uh, started elsewhere uh, and uh, patient presented with um, such treatment. We'll conclude the session. Thank you, everyone. Uh, because right now umbilical cord has the more number of collagen and the mesenchymal cells which is a totipotent in nature is also present in subamnion. As an object uh, for this, we, we have aimed to do a study to evaluate the clinical outcome of the umbilical cord patch grafting in deep corneal ulcer with perforation and desmetocil. For that, we have done a prospective interventional non-randomized single lung, single centered study with 48 patients. All of them are followed up for at least six months and this entire study duration was for one and a half years. This study has three phases. Um, from 18 to 65 years old patients has been included in this with both genders. Corneal perforation due to, the, uh, due to infection or non-infectious cause and the size between 3.5 to 4.5 millimeter has been included with no prior history of keratoplasty. Uh, as outcome, uh, graft host integration, corneal thickness over the time period, re-epithelialization time, improvement in visual equity and anterior chamber depth has been taken. As an interventional procedure, first um, the measurement of the defect has been done and then the twice of the measurement uh, has been cut out from the dried umbilical cord and then it is trimmed in a fashion of circular uh, manner and then it is placed over the cornea. Then it is soaked with balancel solution and sutured with 8 10 -0 monofilament nylon. Then the anterior chamber is filled with air and BCL has been placed over it. As a result, you can see in this case, a desmetocil with vascularization was present and then the umbilical cord patch grafting is done. Uh, after post of six months, you can see there is no vascularization, um, inflammation has decreased and the graft host integration is good. In this case, a patient came with trauma uh, and a 3.5 millimeter perforation was there. This patient has also undergone um, umbilical cord patch grafting and after that, this patient has also gone under cataract surgery and the visual outcome was 624 unaided. In this uh, serial pictograph, you can see the slit lamp examination shows the um, re-epithelialization, which is evident also in the AS OCT. In this pictograph, serial pictograph, you can see in the post of three months, there is a clear demarcation line between the uh, umbilical cord and the um, uh, graft. But in post of six months, there is no clear demarcation line. That means the graft and host integration is going good. 
Uh, in this histopathology, you can see there is epithelial hyperplasia, which is coming from the uh, umbilical cord, and the granulation tissue, which is occurring due to the, uh, the scarring which is formed. Uh, there is a compact collagen uh, due to the umbilical cord, and the newly collagen formed uh, fiber is forming in the cornea beh uh, behind that. Uh, the re mean reepithelial time is uh, 19 days and the mean graft host integration time was 84 days. The mean corneal thickness was uh, 412 micron after 6 months and mean um, umbilical cord thickness was 206 micron after 3 months. Uh, there was no significant change uh, of the visual equity over the time in central perforation though in the peripheral perforation there is increase. Uh, the anterior chamber uh, depth was um, there is no significant change. Um, in this time period, we have seen one patient has developed hypopion, two patients has developed vascularization, and one patient has developed corneal thinning. As a conclusion, I can say that umbilical cord patch grafting gives a good tectonic support uh, for the corneal perforation and desmetosyl. It helps healing of the inflammation, and the graft host integration is also good, and it maintains the anatomy of the anterior chamber in the time period. As a limitation, I can say the sample size is uh, small and the follow-up period should be more to see the late complications and the longer post-operative outcomes. These are my references. Thank you. So uh, are you transplanting their umbilical cord or amniotic membrane only? I am tra transplanting the portion of the umbilical cord, which, uh, which is the external part of the umbilical cord, which consists the amnion and the subamnion. Amnion and? Subamnion. Okay, what so is what happening? Uh, umbilical cord const constitute uh, chorion also, no? Yes, I am uh, telling you uh, the how it is being prepared. Like, uh, we don't do it in the our institute. One of the, the company does it. I have no financial interest on that. Um, what they does, uh, they cut out the umbilical cord and then they uh, pull out the all water jelly and the vessels. So that leaves to the uh, subamnion and the amnion part. So then they, it approximately uh, becomes the size of uh, 250 micron when it is uh, not dried. So then they just do a dry heat of this because if they put any kind of um, chemical in it, then it, the, that will lose their totipotency and the uh, protective nature of the amniotic membrane. So they just dry heat it and uh, that shrunk up at around uh, 150 to 100 micron is based on the how they are cutting it. So that we are actually um, grafting over here. So actually it is uh, amnion part of that umbilical cord only, no? Amniotic membrane amnion and subamnion so part of the umbilical cord. So technically is it correct to call it umbilical cord part uh, transplantation or we can call it as amnion transplantation? It is not only amnion because only, uh, only amnion has the amniotic membrane, yes. just amniotic membrane. But in this case there are, uh, I should have give that of the picture, they have subamnion part, there is a thicker collagen part and then the amnion part. So it's a tri-layered combination of the thing. So this is much more thicker than the only amniotic membrane. So it is freshly prepared uh, membrane? No, membrane. this is not freshly prepared. This is a stored and dried thing, which can be stored for approximately six months. They have an expiry date of six months. So you used only single layered over it or multi-layered? Uh? I have used only single layered and that's quite sufficient for this thing. How does it integrate? Because just putting a single layer without... Uh, Sir, I can show you the serial pictograph. Yeah, I saw the pictures. So, so uh, because what in amnion we use multi-layered, in uh, tenens patch we actually push it into the perforation. But yes. here you have not done anything of that. I have not done anything because uh, what I have seen due to the time course, like even in the uh, keratoplasty what I have seen, uh, what we know that the epithelial grows over the so here when I put the uh, um, um, umbilical cord patch over the desmetocell or the perforation then the gradual epithelium has been grown over there but you can see in this, uh, can I show? Um, no, we won't go back to the paper. So uh, 
I think basically the umbilical cord has been used and there are many studies. It's just that it's a little difficult to procure because yes, it's, it's commercially available. That's the one you used. Yes. So I think the question here is, and many studies have actually reported both umbilical cord and amniotic membrane together. Yes, so sir. it's just, uh, it seems to be tectonically less uh, able to cover a, a corneal perforation, unlike multilayered amniotic membrane, because that has, uh, maybe a multilayered umbilical cord could have been a better option, I don't know. Exactly. So uh, you have, uh, how do you procure this? Um, um, there's a company uh, that sells it? Yeah, yeah. Ma'am, ma ma can I uh, name the company now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. A, you don't have any a, financial. It's a life cell uh, company. Uh, they provide three types of uh, product. One is Amnion One, which consists do you, only You don't amnion. have any financial? In no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they have only uh, amniotic uh, membrane. Yeah. Yeah, amnion One. The amnion two, uh, amnio plus two is amniotic membrane plus chorion, and the amnio plus thick is that AMUC patch, what umbilical cord patch okay. is. And this is uh, in ophthalmology used very rarely, right? It is used more in systemic medication, systemic surgery. Uh, uh, pardon, ma'am. So the ophthal uses of umbilical cord is less, right, as yes, compared to systemic. Yes, ma'am. Is it used in dermatology or any other place? Yes, they previously used for dermatology cases. And I, uh, we have uh, uh, another study going on th uh, that has been used for the um, uh, glaucoma valve shunt covering. Uh, same study is also going on another unit. It is uh, on the with this same. So thing. last question, how much does it cost? Uh, Ma'am, uh, as we are in the government uh, facilities, so what, uh, like it is getting supplied by them, it is free of cost to the patients, okay. but uh, it costs around one and a half uh, K for one umbilical cord. Yeah, patch. that's the reason why we don't use it, Abhishek, it's very expensive. Okay, all right, thank you, Ashish. Thank uh, you, Excellent, keep up the good work. So we have the second presentation we'll have is by Dr. Rakhi Kushumesh. And uh, finally, I get your spelling right, Rakhi. Everywhere else it is incorrect, including your second name. So you're talking about the outcome and course of teen and patch graft in corneal perforation and desmetosy. condition and caused by variety of ocular disorders and if they're not being treated timely they can lead to several complications therefore corneal integrity must be restored promptly to prevent complications and vision loss there are several methods uh, uh, documented in the literature but because of their availability and limitations are not being used routinely so uh, there has been growing interest in use of tenens patch graph because of its uh, major advantage of uh, immediate and all the time availability uh, so this paper was done to assess the efficacy and clinical outcome of T TPG in corneal perforation and desmetocele and also to identify the possible predictors of successful outcome. So this was a study, a retrospective study conducted uh, between 2018 and 21 in 85 eyes of 83 patients who underwent TPG and written consent from patients and approval from IC was obtained. Parameters noted to assess the outcome of TPG were size of corneal lesion, underlying etiology, time to epithelization and scar formation, BCV, and course and outcome of TPG. So all the patients, all the surgery underwent uh, under, uh, was done under peribulbar anesthesia, and first of all, we removed the debris, and uh, uh, then tenens uh, tissue was then uh, harvested from superior nasal cordant and placed on the perforation and desmetocele side, covering all its edges and secured with glue and 10-O uh, monofilament nylon uh, overlay sutures or requ if required, interpreted uh, sutures. So in post-operative treatment, uh, we give uh, topical antibiotics to all patients and corticosteroid and uh, uh, other medication were uh, depending upon uh, the underlying etiology. At least three months follow-up was done including ASOCT, BCV and IOP measurements. Outcome measures, uh, formation of leukomatous corneal scar or reddened leukoma with well-formed or partially formed AC at the end of three months was considered successful treatment. While corneal scar with flat AC, graft dysens, graft ectesia, need of therapeutic PK or evisceration at any point of time of a study was considered uh, treatment failure. 
So in results, average age was 49.3, mean follow-up period was 9.2 to uh, maximum up to 36 months, and majority of the surgeries were done uh, during COVID-19 pandemic when eye banking system were uh, adversely affected. And in 68% cases, uh, we performed in corneal perforation, and 32% cases were in uh, dysmetoseal. And most common underlying etiology was uh, infective keratitis in 48% cases where viral was the commonest one, and followed by uh, autoimmune disorder in which rheumatoid arthritis was the commonest one. Mean size of perforation was 4.07 in perforation and 4.57 in dysmetoseal. 70% of successful cases required subsequent keratoplasty for visual rehabilitation. Uh, in success rate, we had 87% uh, success rate in our study and 13% failure rate, out of which 12% belong to corneal perforation group. The median time uh, taken for a complete epithelization was 3 weeks and range was 3 to 5 weeks. Uh, median duration of scar formation was 15 weeks and complication, graft descents, displacement, ectasia of graft and most commonly the corneal vascularization. We also did uh, logistic regression analysis and found that dysmetoceles, non-infective etiology, over-infective, viral keratitis among all microbial etiologies, and paracentral or peripheral lesion over central were uh, good predictors for successful outcome. So this is a picture of consequences of tenens patch graft. Here you can see the vascularized scar, adrenal leukoma, translucent scar at three years, and the end of three years in SGS patient, double layer TPG in elderly patient, graft melt and graft infection in uh, uh, post-operative period. And here you can see the post-operative course of tenens patch graft in a case of dysmetoseal. At the end of uh, one week here you can see the graft is edematous and uh, irregular. Uh, while at three weeks it becomes more compact, margins are clear and completely epithelized. And at 12 weeks you can see the collagen deposition underneath the graft. So tenens capsule is a dense elastic and vascular fibrous connective tissue. We use anterior part of tenens tissue for uh, the, uh, these lesions. Overall clinical success in our study was 87% and previous study documented 74 to 90%. And since tenens graft is an opaque tissue, you can, uh, visual outcome will be definitely suboptimal and they need keratoplasty. So TPG may be considered as an effective and expensive treatment to restore the structural integrity in perforation and dysmetoceles particularly in condition where deodorant tissue is not available. And uh, ASOCT was found to be a very valuable non-invasive tool for monitoring uh, the status of uh, graft in post-operative period. Thank you. Have you, uh, have you studied histopathologically about uh, the tenens and in any of the cases where subsequently they underwent PK? Uh, we did uh, four optical PK in uh, post-TPG cases, and uh, but we haven't uh, get the report from uh, histopathology for histopathology from uh, pathology department. So uh, we didn't include in the study those photographs. What what would you expect to see? So as opposed to say amniotic membrane or tissue adhesive. Uh, as per their uh, just uh, verbal discussion, they said that there was a collagen <coughs> tissue present uh, in uh, the tissue uh, that we sent for the histopathological examination. Uh, other than that, nothing significant uh, they could document and all. In which cases you have put double layered uh, TPG? Uh, in cases, suppose uh, uh, we have done in three cases when the age of patient was uh, beyond 70 and uh, those patients presented to us, us with the sterile melt in a case of rheumatoid arthritis. So when we harvested the tissue, uh, tenens tissue, it was very thin. And with one layer, uh, we could not achieve a good uh, uh, AC. It, uh, the, it, there was thinning and there was uh, ectasia after putting air into the AC. So we applied uh, double air in those cases. So it is on table only? Uh, yeah, it's on table, table, yes. So you tried without uh, fibrin glue also? Uh, yes, we can do. Fibrin glue gives advantage. Only thing is tenens is very sticky tissue, you know. And uh, when you put fibrin glue and place the tenens, it gives you a good stabilization for the suturing. And overlay suture is another thing which gives uh, the tenens patch because tenens is, doesn't have its own strength in early stages. So overlay sutures gives extra strength to uh, be at proper place. How many cases did you have to redo in uh, Pardon me? Did you have any cases where you had to immediately 
repeat like the next stage uh, of uh, if I uh, talk about the surgical success rate, in only one case, I had to apply suture again in the very uh, next post-operative day because of the wound leak. Otherwise, uh, uh, not in uh, the early post-operative period. All right. Any questions? Any but you said there was 74% success rate. 11% uh, failure, so yeah, what was the Yeah, 87% success and 12% failure, and failure one basically in uh, the cases who had uh, a fungal or bacterial etiology, uh, microbi microbial uh, keratitis induced perforation cases. So, how do you deal with them to avoid failure? Um, in majority of cases, they be labeled fail because the tenons, the AC, everything collapsed together and there was flat AC with the uh, uh, scar, so we labeled them fail, and uh, afterwards we registered them for therapeutic or tectonic PK. So and one case lent up into evisceration because we didn't have any cornea, and the perforation was very large, and the patient had uh, uh, bacterial keratitis, which was not controlled by any means. So, in active infection, uh, would you rather prefer uh, something yeah, like uh, uh, cyanoacrylate uh, glue or something better than? Uh, actually, the perforation size was four plus. So I won't advise glue in these cases, but uh, among microbial keratitis, I would say that viral performs well rather than fungal or bacterial. I would avoid uh, doing uh, tenus patch graft in fungal and uh, bacterial or any unknown pathology. But viral, uh, we can easily do tenus patch graft with good outcome, no doubts. Thank you so much.